articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one crowd. Then from north to south and east to west, we'd hear Christ be magnified. The whole earth echoing his eminence His name would burst from sea and sky From rivers to the mountain tops We'd hear Christ be magnified Oh, be magnified Christ be magnified Just let his praise arise Christ be magnified in me Singing oh Christ be magnified From the altar of my life Christ be magnified in me In most melody, every human heart its native cry, and then in one in raptured him of praise, we'll say, Christ, be magnified, be magnified. Magnify your glory, God. Oh, less of me, more of you. Less of me, more of you. Less of me, more of you. No, I won't bow to idols. I'll stand strong and worship you. If it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice cause you're it too. No, I won't be formed by fears, I'll hold fast to what is true. If the cross brings transformation, I'll be crucified with you. Cause death is just the doorway to resurrection life. If I join you in your suffering, I'll join you when you rise When you return in glory With all the angels and the saints My heart will still be singing My song will be the same And I won't bow to idols I'll stand strong and worship It puts me in the fight I'll rejoice, I'll rejoice cause you're there too Oh, I won't be formed by feelings I will fast to what is true If the cross brings transformation I'll be crucified Cause death is just the joy Into resurrection life If I join you in your sufferings Then I'll join you Fire! 
got nothing new. How could I express all my gratitude? I could sing these songs as I often do, but every song must and you never do so i throw up my hands and praise you again and again because all that i have is a hallelujah hallelujah i know it's not much and nothing else fits
our voice to the King now. Oh, 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 so grateful to you this morning. And church, I would ask that um, as we're in this time of, of prayer and, and reflection, what's behind your hallelujah this morning? It's all that I've got is a hallelujah. What else is fit for a king? But there's a reason that you have the hallelujah. So let's just take a moment and in your own words, just express your gratitude. What is it that the Lord did for you this week? Where did he protect you that you weren't even aware of, maybe in the moment? Where has he brought provision for you? That's what's behind that hallelujah. It's that gratitude for what an amazing God we have that takes such love and care. So go ahead and express your gratitude specifically for how he's shown his love and care for you. Lord, forgive us where we've been shy in expression of our gratitude to you. Lord, there's so much that you have done that we see, but so much more that we don't even see, that you're doing behind the scenes in our lives. There's times that we don't see things happening, and yet there's so many things that are getting in place. And then when the picture becomes clear, then we give that hallelujah. Lord, I pray right now that we would be people of expressive gratitude even when we haven't seen the final answer. Lord, that we'd express that to you just in our trust and belief 
that you're working things out for our good, that you are a keeper of your promises, that we can trust you. So Lord, we offer our hallelujah, our gratefulness, our gratitude for you in all those ways. And in your way, name we pray, amen. Amen. All right, well, go ahead and smile at somebody that's near you. I want to give a huge welcome to all of you that are new to Grow Point. I was hanging out in the lobby. Uh, my name is Leslie. I'm on the pastoral team. I serve with the kids mainly on Sunday morning, so I don't get to see uh, anybody usually over the age of 12. Um, so this is kind of a treat for me to get to actually look at faces over the age of 12. Um, and I'm just amazed at the number of you that came through our lobby and our narthex today that I truly have not had the opportunity to meet. And I want to acknowledge for those of you that are on the newer side of our, our spectrum here that um, it took a lot of courage for you to step into a church for the first time. In fact, I did a little research today just in thinking about sharing this morning, and they were talking about the five emotions that people have when they come to a new church. Let me read them off to you. All right, fear. Oh no, what am I gonna encounter there? Regret. Do you know people make their decision within six seconds of whether like this is a church I, I wanna pursue more of or not? Confusion, distraction, but I love this, hope. So again, just a huge shout out to you for coming this morning. And, and I hope what you find here is a community of people that weren't obligated to come. It wasn't out of ritual that they're in this room today, but there's truly a heart that says, I wanna worship in community with people that are also pursuing Jesus. Because that's, that's just who we are. There's not a whole lot of flash or anything like that. Man, we're just regular people on a path of pursuing to be more like Jesus. And I also know there's a lot more than just coming in the door. That there's a desire, or at least I would hope, a desire to connect with like-minded Jesus-pursuing people. And so one of those ways I wanna highlight today is a week from Thursday night, we are having the first of our ladies' nights for 2024. And what that is, is we do a meal together. It's $10. Um, I'll tell you ways to register, but we have a meal together. And then we're gonna have a speaker sharing her story, and that's gonna be Sam Caroli this month. And then we're also going to, yes, worthy of applause for sure. It's gonna be so good hearing Sam's story. And then table conversation, sharing as little or as much as you'd like about how that relates to your life. So we just encourage you, especially those of you that are like, I'm just trying to find my place, my people. Take a risk. Have some courage because there's some ladies that would love to meet you. Easy way to register. We actually have a kiosk out in the lobby today by the ladies' restrooms. You can get signed up there and also um, online, inside the, well, in the back of the chair in front of you, there's a um, paper that is like our monthly news. There's a QR code. You can hit that and you can find that event as well. We try to make it as easy as possible for you because um, we really don't want on anybody to miss out in being part of what God's doing here at Grow Point. So, all right, well, let's get ready to hear the word this morning. You all ready for that? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Leslie. Well, how are we doing this morning? All right, you look good. You don't look too frozen. It was like, what, 19 on the way to work? Or way to work, on the way. <laughs> we are gonna do some work today, but um, listen, we're gonna, we're gonna start our time together with a couple questions. Before I ask the questions, a quick reminder, kind of a recap of where we've been. We've been on this series that's been providing this constant current over the last several weeks that we've called You Are Here. And so if you envision a aerial map with that pin drop in the middle of it that lets you know where you are, and then you can kind of see everything around you, and that way you're like, okay, this is where I am, and that's where I'd like to be. Our life in general is like, <clears throat> is like that, where right now, real time, we are, we are living these days. 
I didn't get to choose this, right? We, we all were brought into this, this time, at this time, living these days, and there's, there's something beautiful and there's something wonderfully challenging about that. And, and so it's good for us regularly to cue in where we are and being mindful of where we've yet to go. And so we've been doing that. And, and so that, that phrase, you are here, has been this constant thread. And we've also been bringing into this conversation consistently the topic of, of prayer. So today is, um, you know, Leslie rattled off those, those five emotions of those that are visiting or guests with us this morning. I'm hoping that after this message, it is not one of regret for coming here. So um, I'm hoping that this is gonna be a good morning because we are going to talk about and land on and practically apply confession. Does that sound fun or what? <laughs> Sounds like a great Sunday to come in. And there, there's something so significant about living a pattern of, of confession, even repentance. We, we come into that place of not, I would say, freedom and purpose as we live a life and establish a pattern of, of confession and repentance. So the couple questions, and I was, I was encouraged to not rush by these two questions. If you wanna write these down, you're more than welcome to. They're not up on the screen, but I wanna ask these two questions to get us started this morning. How do you handle or respond to corrective moments? And corrective moments can happen in any, any certain way. I mean, there, there are conversations between spouses that, that refine one another. We, those that are married can attest to that. Um, this can even be related to work. The, where it gets really challenging and, and people throughout, I don't know, their whole life, they, they wrestle with getting a sure footing in the context of church where you start getting immersed into a body of believers and inviting people to speak into your life. Not everyone, some, let me, let me phrase it this way. There's a lot of people that wanna be at church, but they want to be at church without being bothered or being pressed on. And, and I don't know that I've found any scriptures to support that approach to community where it's based on convenience and comfort and not being refined into the image of Jesus. In order for us to be refined into the image of Jesus, that requires not only conversations with one another, but also conversations with our Heavenly Father. I, I think sometimes we have more comfort with conversations with our Heavenly Father than we do with one another. Because I don't know about you, but I've seen this play out where somebody's like, well, how dare you point this out on me when you've got that in your own life kind of stuff. We, we could digress a whole bunch of different ways. But let me go back to that first question. How do you respond or handle corrective moments? Is your tendency to respond in humble confession or hubris concealment? And what I mean by that is you can do no wrong even though you know you do wrong. And so what you're going to do is work hard at a facade to give people the impression that you've got it together while never acknowledging the truth of what's going on behind the facade. That's hubris concealment. I've got this, you worry about you, I'm, gonna, I'm good. You do your thing. The second question is, are confession and repentance familiar or foreign to you? Now, I don't know quite what to make of it already where y'all are the second service, okay? Y'all are supposed to be the more lively bunch, but the first service was way more responsive even now at this point in the message, and y'all got me a little bit nervous. Like, did I miss this one? Or am I not supposed to talk about confession? I'm not gonna cave to what I'm feeling because there's so much significance and benefit and, and health established when we establish a lifestyle of confession and repentance. Now immediately, right now, as, as even with the opening, a lot of y'all have in your mind what confession and repentance look like and it's wrapped up in a lot of shame. 
And that's why maybe there's a lot of, there's some silence, maybe some discomfort. And the reason why confession and repentance needs to be an established pattern is because I would rather confess to the things that are arguably arbitrary, but I know that if I don't, don't confess here, what that means is if I keep concealing the things that I know I need to confess, there's going to be an implosion later on down the road. Because if I got away with this this far, I can just tiptoe my way into possibly worse things so long as I keep convincing myself that I've got the facade up. And so if we, and it, it, this isn't just, like we're gonna land on a story today that's like, oh, well, I don't deal with that and that must be what this is all about. No, this comes up in every facet of who we are as a human being. Your, your, your anger held, um, not held in check. Um, your words not held in check, your, your thoughts not held in check. These are worthy things to confess so that they don't become more deeply attached and part of who you are. Our verse, like as a church, but speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into Christ who is the head of the church. That is a lifestyle of of, it's a community lifestyle where we trust one another and we can, it, it's not a, I think there are depths of confession that, that would be wildly healing. But trust is, is crucial for that to happen. We've got to trust that we are no different from one another. My brokenness might be strung out in different sentences, but brokenness is brokenness. And if I ever think or convince myself that my brokenness isn't as bad as, then that's where the breakdown of trust happens. And here's another little thing for you. If you've ever convinced yourself, if you've ever made this statement, it's just, and then fill in the blank, Later on in the year, we're gonna have, this is gonna be fun, we're gonna do a series about sin. That's gonna be fun, right? Because there's so much ambiguity of like, what is sin? There's actually like eight Hebrew words that define and describe sin. The English language has boiled it down to one word, sin. And so a lot of times, it's this convincing ourselves of it's just that, at least it's not that, that's dangerous territory, okay? So I wanna read a song that was written by, by someone, you might already guess it. Um, you, you could guess who it is, but I wanna read this without giving the address just to make it um, a potentially curios, a curiosity for you. So this is um, a song written by somebody. Here are the lyrics. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. When I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away and I groaned all day long. Day and night your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stop trying to hide my guilt, I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. Therefore, let all the godly pray to you while there is still time that they may not drown in the floodwaters of judgment. For you are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with songs of victory. The Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. Don't be like a senseless horse or mule. You can look up the King James Version for a remix on those two words. But don't be like a senseless mule that needs to be, have a bit and brittle, bridle sorry, to keep you under control. Many sorrows will come to the wicked, but unfailing love surrounds those who trust the Lord. So rejoice in the Lord and be glad, all you who obey him. Shout for joy, all you whose hearts are pure. If you were to guess 
Who wrote that? What would you say? David, Paul, I heard Paul in there. Okay, now we're, we're gonna land on David. David wrote it. But here's what's really fascinating. It's not shepherd boy, David, who had this revelation while he's out with the sheep and he's like, oh my gosh, in the presence of God, I'm, I, I'm aware of my brokenness and my sinfulness. It wasn't shepherd David. It also wasn't a little bit older warrior David who has been out to fight battles and God has covered him and then there's like these moments where again, he's like, oh, I'm, I'm broken, I'm sinful and I need God's grace. It wasn't even warrior David. It wasn't even the David that was excited about the ark coming into its homeland where he's like dancing. I think he danced naked maybe, but he was really severely underclothed and he was really excited, but it wasn't that David either. This David was King David who is about 60 years old writing a song after after having an adulterous relationship with Bathsheba. That blew my mind when I found that. I, I always thought this was like 30-year-old David, but scholars believe that David was about 55 to 60 years old, shacking up with probably an 18 to 20-year-old. What business does he have writing this kind of a song at this point in his life? I think there's a, we're gonna get into this story because you can't just like read the lyrics of a song like that and not get into his stuff. Which, by the way, have you ever thought about this? Like, I wonder if David ever wrote these confessions thinking one day my life is gonna be preached. One day people are gonna know what happened. Not only with Goliath, but also Bathsheba. We're going to get into this a little bit because it, goes, it shows us the significance of establishing a life, a lifestyle of confession and repentance versus hubris concealment, arrogant cover-ups. And so for our, for our fun reading today, I wanna encourage y'all to turn to 2 Samuel. And we do have a lot of reading that we're gonna go through today. I don't even apologize for it, but we're gonna walk our way through chapters 11 and most of 12 and let David and his life educate us and compel us to live a life and establish a lifestyle of confession and repentance. It's worth noting before we start reading, that there is a, a war that has been taking place, a, an actual, literal, physical war, and it's against the Ammonites. Um, where we're going to start right now, we could rewind the tape a full year, and the Ammonites had already been defeated, but um, the weather turned on, on them, and so both um, opposing um, armies retreated for the, for the colder months. And, and so now, typically, David would go to battle with the army. For whatever reason, we're going to see here that David stays back home while he sends the full force of the Israel army to... ...at the beginning. So we pick up in chapter 11 of 2 Samuel, and it reads like this. In the spring of the year, when kings normally go to war, David sent Joab, Joab is his nephew, he sent Joab and the Israel, Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Reba or Rabbah. However, David stayed back in Jerusalem. Y'all say stayed back. So David stayed back in Jerusalem late one afternoon. Now, I don't mean to be offensive here, but this gives evidence to the fact that David's old, okay? Late one afternoon after his midday rest, okay? Y'all know what I'm talking about. Like, there's just something about, something refreshing about an afternoon nap. Some of you are gonna go do that after you eat lunch today. There's just something about a Sunday nap. Don't judge me on it. I'm just saying old people take naps. <laughs> I'm glad that wasn't a hey you. That was an amen. So, all right. Late one afternoon, after his midday rest, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. 
as he looked out over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. And he sent someone to find out who she was. And we're gonna stop right here before we go any further. We know he's older because he's taken midday naps. He's also like, I've fought enough. I just don't feel like wielding my sword anymore. And so he just stays back while the rest of the army goes out. And he begins walking on the roof of the palace. And, and it just says, looking, looking. And then it uses a different word that he noticed. There's a big difference between looking and noticing. So David, out there on the rooftop, and this woman of unusual beauty catches his eye. And rather than continue, continuing to look around, his glances became a gaze, a fixed gaze. And then that longing look caused him to be an investigator of who that woman is. Now, at this point in the story, <clears throat> if David had an established pattern of confession and repentance, he would not have sent messengers to figure out who Bathsheba was. He would have went to his advisors and been like, yo, um, I just woke up and I was strolling around on the rooftop and I caught a glance of some woman that I don't even know and um, I'm just letting you know, I think I'm due for a second nap now and I'm just gonna sleep this off. But I wanna confess that to you so that I'm held in check. My Bible doesn't read that way though because it goes on to say something different. There is no confession at that point. There is no repentance. I mean, you, and you might argue, well, there's nothing to repent of. Uh, guys, you know. You, you know. You, you know when a, like just a look turns into a fixation And so he could have had a different conversation. And so rather than holding himself accountable, he sends some guys to give an account of this woman. And so they come back and they're like, all right, we did a little bit of research. This is who she is. Y'all wanna, uh, it just gets, if we get into the story a little bit, it gets uncomfortable, okay? And I think it's okay to feel a little discomfort because it's just appropriate, right? So here's the research that got reported back to him. Now, it just mentions two names, Eliam and Uriah. But Eliam had a dad, and Eliam's dad is the grandfather of Bathsheba. Eliam was one of David's most trusted counselors, so he would advise David on things throughout the course of his life. And then we have Eliam, who was one of David's best fighters, best warriors. Without question, they fought battles together. And then if that wasn't enough familiarity or enough information for him, it also came back that Bathsheba was married to Uriah, and Uriah, if you continue reading throughout 2 Samuel, in David's last words, he gives honor to, some of the, to 37 of the mightiest warriors. Uriah rounds out that list at the bottom. There's part of me that wonders, because of how things transpire with Uriah, if, if it wasn't a, a courtesy I'm, I'm just putting these, this in here because of how bad this was for Uriah. You'll understand here, and we'll, we'll get this in a minute. So she is the granddaughter of your, one of your most consistent advisors. She is the daughter of someone that you have fought with, 
and she's married. That information also didn't stop David. It goes on to say this. Then David sent messengers to get her. Now, this was not invitational. They went to her place and got her. You could wrap that up in all kinds of colorful language today. When she came to the palace, palace he slept with her. Now here's some information that's, that's important just for, as far as the storyline. She had just completed the purification rites after having menstrual period. Then she returned home. Later, when Bathsheba discovered that she was pregnant, she sent David this really lengthy message saying, I'm pregnant. A little bit of time passes before you, before at this day and age, they didn't have like the immediate pregnancy test readers, right? So there's a little bit of time that transpires. Maybe it was like the next cycle, missed her cycle or whatever. Maybe her stomach started growing and she's like, okay, so I'm putting the pieces together here. I need to get a word to David. I'm pregnant. Somewhere between verse five and verse six, a plan is hatched in David's mind and his heart. And, and, and this is one of those things where David should have been guided by his heart more than his mind. He didn't feel the severity of his actions. We can see this because he immediately began to devise a plan to cover up rather than feel the weight that would lead him to repentance. David sent word to Joab, his nephew, remember, hey, I, I want you to send me Uriah the Hittite. By the way, Uriah the Hittite means, it doesn't say Uriah the Israelite. He's, he's, from a, a, he's another region, another, um, uh, an, another people group. And we're gonna find that Uriah has more honor and character and loyalty, not only to his his fellow warriors, but also to, to God, which is crazy because we could throw into this conversation that David is called a man after God's own heart. And this might be one of those stories where it's like, so um, if this happened, then how did he get that title? How can someone do these things and be called a man after God's own heart? I'm, to that, I would be like, I know, right? David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite, so Joab sent, sent him to David. When Uriah arrived, David asked Joab, or he, he asked him how Joab and the army were getting along and how the war was progressing. Then he told Uriah, go home and relax. David even sent a gift to Uriah after he had left the palace, but Uriah didn't go home. He slept that night at the palace entrance with the king's palace guard. And so it was just, it was... Um, protocol <clears throat> within military. When, when war is happening, this isn't a time to, even when you come back in the territory of home, you're not gonna go back home and, and have some intimate moments with your wife because you're, you're gonna, your perspective, your heart, all of this kind of stuff, it's just gonna, it, it's gonna create a longing in you that we just don't have time to deal with. We've got a battle to fight. And so it was just protocol. It was just understood. So David brings Uriah home with the hope that he's going to be excited about being close to his bride again and, and maybe they'll have sex and, and then we can cover this whole thing up. And Uriah's like, um, no, um, thanks for the invitation. Thanks for the gift. Many believe that it was like wine and, and food that David sent to the house. Like, hey, just y'all just have a, a little party on me. So when David learned that Uriah never went home, he summoned him and said, what's, what's the matter? This is logical. You, you have my invite to go home. Why didn't you go home last night after being away for so long? And this was, listen to Uriah's loyalty to God and to Israel and to his fellow warriors. The ark and the armies of Israel and Judah are living in tents and Joab and my master's men are camping in the open fields. How could I go home to wine and dine and sleep with my wife? I swear that I would never do such a thing. 
There's, there's, there's honor and there's resolve. There's character within Uriah. So then David, we'll, we'll skip some verses here just for the sake of time, but David's like, okay, if, if he's not gonna do it by my, if he's not gonna progress with my plan by an invitation, I'm gonna invite him just to hang out here in my palace for a couple days, and then he's like, I'm gonna get him drunk, and then the guard's gonna be down, and then he will go sleep with his wife, and then all of this is gonna be done. So Uriah hangs out, David gets him drunk, and he still will not go home and be intimate with his wife. So then David's like, I'm running out of ideas. And this is the nature of concealment. The solutions never get easier as time goes by. The story and the collateral damage only gets more severe. Always. You will never read a story where it's like, I thought about killing them, but then I just asked them not to. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't go from a severe degree to an easy one. So David says in verse, it goes like this in verse 14. The next morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and gave it to Uriah to deliver. The letter instructed Joab, remember, uncle, nephew. David is sending Uriah back to his nephew with this note. I want you to station Uriah on the front lines where the battle is fiercest. Then pull back so that he will be killed. If I was Joab, I might have had some questions, right? So uncle, um, what? This makes no sense. What, and, and Joab would have known the character of Uriah as well. So this, like, what did Uriah do while he was gone to deserve such orders? And what's, what's crazy about this, Uriah goes to Joab carrying a letter with his death sentence. Crazy. So all of that happened. We, we'll skip over it. Um, they, they, they went right at that, the, that particular city where the fiercest battle was taking place. They withdrew. Uriah died. And so they were nervous about giving this report, this loss report, coming back to David. So Joab was like, when you give that update, just be sure that you end it by saying, Uriah's dead. He's been killed. Listen to how concerned David is for Uriah dying. After the report came to David, it says this in verse 25. Well, tell Joab not to be discouraged, David said. The sword devours this one today and that one tomorrow. Fight harder next time and conquer the city. It's, it's wild, right? Keep bringing into this conversation a man after God's own heart. A man after God's own heart. Adulterer, murderer, concealer. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. And when the period of mourning was over, David sent for her and brought her to the palace and she became one of his wives. Then she gave birth to a son. So we know that, you think about this, we're reading this in a matter of minutes. This is a matter of nine months being played out, right? And the chapter, chapter 11 ends this way. But the Lord was displeased with what David had done. There, there's a sneaky lie that, that rests within trying to conceal things. It's the lie that God doesn't see it. It's the lie that we, we can convince ourselves like, I can hide this in front of other humanity simultaneously hiding this from God. This is what's remarkable about, remarkable about God's love for us. He sees everything. And, and I don't say that in a way of, to strike this big brother kind of fear within us, but he sees everything. And even with him seeing every thought, every emotion, every, um, every motivation, he still pursues us. And his desire for us is that all of this concealing 
and constructing and facading and covering up. He's like, man, the part that grieves him the most is how much it deteriorates who we are. He wants us to live with passion, but he doesn't want us to be impassioned to the extent that it leads us to this place where we, we rob life from one another. So this is how God lovingly yet accurately addresses David. God sends the prophet Nathan This is where we begin in chapter 12, to share with David a story. It's a parable. Some think it's a parable. It's just just a story. And without reading it word for word, this is the gist of the story. There was a really rich man who had a lot of cattle, a lot of sheep, um, just surplus, right? And and then there was a, a very poor individual who had a prized lamb or prized sheep. It, this, this animal was such, um, uh, uh, bless you, it was so special to the family that the, it even ate from the table, okay? It was that dear to him. So the rich man had a guest come to his house and they're like, let's prepare a meal. So rather than grabbing from his own, he takes this prized lamb from this poor man to prepare a meal. And this, after... After Nathan shares that story with David, this is David's response. He was furious. As surely as the Lord lives, he vowed, any man who would do such a thing deserves to die. He must repay four lambs to the poor man for the one that he stole and for having no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are that man. Now, I don't like these kind of moments at all, but it's necessary for us to feel the weight of this because we all, we, we all have our own brokenness, okay? And, and we all have our, um, in our world today, it's so interesting. I can't remember if I said already that we're gonna have a series about sin. I think I did. But sin has a penalty and the penalty of sin is death. So, when Nathan is making that statement to David, he's making that statement to all of humanity because in some way, shape, or form, we've all missed the mark. We've all sinned. We've all concealed. We've all done our work. We've all done our strategizing and manipulating. Or We've all done it. You are that man. And from that point on, he goes through this list of all of the things that God had done for him throughout his lifetime, reminding him of all of God's favor and his grace and and all of the things, the victories throughout David's life. And he gives the verdict of the, the punishment of his sin. And because we have a broad spectrum of of demographic in here. I won't give the full measure of it. But after David hears Nathan give the the decision, gives God's decision over his life, this is David's response, verse 13. Then David confessed to Nathan. Now, I think what's really interesting is, depending on what translation you read, most translations simply say, then David said, I love how the the New Living says David confessed. To confess is literally to say. David said, David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, yes, but the Lord has forgiven you and you won't die for this sin. It doesn't get much better beyond that point, but we'll stop right there. All of this could have been circumvented had David established a pattern of repentance and confession. But because he was so filled with this desire for the one that he was glancing at from the rooftop 
And because confession was not part of his life, we, have, we, we arrive at this place where yes, there's forgiveness and you're not gonna die for this, but there are still repercussions for your decisions. So what we have to ask ourselves is this. Going back to the first two questions that I asked, there are all types of Nathan type moments in our life. There are all different types of Nathans in our life who are there by God's grace to speak truth. Is our response one of humble confession or arrogant concealment? I keep mentioning this book that I I read earlier, um, late last year into this year, called uh, Praying Like Monks, Living Like Fools. And, And I just love, love, love how he words and how he Um, encourages prayer, but specifically that he has one chapter called Search Me and Know Me. And this is on page 83. It won't be up on the screen, but just listen to these words. The desperate need of our time is not for successful Christians, popular Christians, or winsome Christians. It's for deep Christians. And the only way to become a deep Christian is through the inner excavation called confession. The pathway to spiritual maturity is a descent, not an ascent. A maturing community, and this is the part that just got me. And pastorally speaking, this is my hope as we continue to be a community compelled by grace to grow. This is my hope for Grow Point. A maturing community is a confessing community. Not a church without sin, but a church without secrets. I know we made lie at at the beginning of the service about the five emotions that people feel when they visit churches, but I'll be honest with you, all of them resonate with me because... I, I, before I was Pastor Josh, I, I was simply, and I still prefer to just be Josh who's following Jesus. And throughout my 44 years of life, I have seen plenty of church expressions where people excel at a facade yet ignore the termite wood, termite eaten wood that's holding up the facade. And so I'm just gonna come in and present my smile and say the churchy lingo and ignore the real stuff in my heart or in my mind, my motives. And and when when you get a taste of that, anybody would be nauseated by church. Who would want to be a part of it? Now, here's what, here's where the rubber meets the road for this moment here. We can't say that we have a distaste for it and yet still be reluctant to confess. Does that make sense? We can't have an attitude towards things that we don't like about church and us not take steps away from the direction that we don't like. Otherwise, uh, we're no different, right? Amen, okay. David confessed to prophet Nathan. I think that encounter is a private expression of what God would love to see happen collectively. Anywhere that I read, like like New Testament, for example, James, the book of James, I think it's profound that he said, at the end of his, his letter, he says, confess your sins to one another and then you'll be healed. See, we um, have a tendency, I'll, I'll say this, I, I know my tendency is to make confession comfortable. So I will overgeneralize what I'm confessing so it doesn't hurt too bad. And I don't even mind confessing 
in a collective place. Like there's, there's, when I was researching this, I was like, how do you, because I was, I was curious, how do you lead a c- corporate confession? And I thought about having some, some prayer written on the screen that we'd all say together, but even that is so comfortable. Well, we're all reading the same thing, acknowledging our sin. Yeah, but it's, it's so generalized. What would it look like for a maturing community to be a confessing community? What would it look like to have a church, not without sin, but without secrets? How could we trustingly be transparent with one another and even specific with one another? I'm convinced that there's something profoundly refining and life-giving if we can get comfortable with the discomfort of confession. Where we confess to one another, one another. This is, the reason why I didn't wanna do the prayer on the, the screen thing is because that's just one, not another. Does that make sense? It's reciprocated. So what that looks like is, I'm going to, this is how it's gonna play out practically for us this morning or this afternoon. Before we just rattle off a bunch of things to confess, I think what's important is for us to wait in the presence of our heavenly father who loves us to pieces, who loves us like crazy and have him reveal what we need to confess. I would rather him, there there are some things where we just know, okay? Like I cussed at somebody the other day, okay? I I should, I don't need God to reveal that to me, that wasn't right. I'm I'm giving that as an example, I'm not saying that I, okay, just for clarity, all right. (laughs) But here's the part about confession. Confession means saying, So we're gonna listen to our Heavenly Father to reveal. Then we are going to write it down. We're gonna name it. And then then we are going to confess. And we are gonna do this trustingly. We're gonna do it tastefully. Um, We're we're also not gonna try to fix each other like, my, my, like, this is an example, like, you know, the other day I had this thought about somebody and I was just fixated on that thought and I was just, oh. Well, here's a seven step process that you can go through to fix those thoughts. That, we're not here to fix one another. We're here to allow the presence of the living God to wash over us as we mutually confess what God reveals to us. All right, before I just start rambling anymore, I would encourage you to grab your grow card. And even right now, Heavenly Father, my prayer and this invitation is for you to speak. Show us what we need to confess. And so we, as your sons and daughters, we wait on you and we invite you to speak.
If you haven't done so already, I would want to invite you to go ahead and, and name it, write it down. Here's where the, the life happens. And here's where transformation happens. I'm not saying that you're gonna feel something or something crazy is gonna, but what I am gonna say is that this expression and this demonstration of confession is healing your soul, your heart, and your mind in intricate ways that are beyond description. And so this is what, what I'm gonna encourage us to do is for you to say what you wrote to someone that you're close by and don't let it just say, okay, here's mine, what's yours? But share what you wrote, but then one of you or both of you can pray, offering a prayer of gratitude for the healing that happens with confession, all right? So the rest is on you. Go ahead and let's practice confession right now. Go ahead. once you have shared and prayed, I want to invite you to stand your feet. I don't want to stretch this out too long. I love this phrase that a maturing community is a confessing community. 
our hope and our prayer collectively for this body of Jesus followers should be that we are a confessing community. If we say that we don't have sin, we make Jesus out to be a liar. So we know that he died on the cross because humanity needed that to happen. None of us are without sin. Therefore, none of our lives should be without confession. And I promise you that if we establish a pattern of confessing with one another, the richness of being part of the body of Christ will be so, so healing. And there's something so refreshing and so good about living life free rather than living life putting on the facade. A facade is exhausting. So Heavenly Father, I pray that we would be people who don't walk around with this shiny veneer, but that we are people who have invited you into every space of our being. And whatever you reveal, and whatever you bring to the surface, we want to have this established, genuine practice of confessing. We love you. We thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, y'all. Go ahead, all you old people, take your afternoon nap. All right? (laughs) We love y'all. Have a good Sunday.